I don't really know how to start shows. Come on now, don't start, don't start liking me now. So yeah, I'm funny compared to you. Know, well, you'll see later. I stand for my own. I know a lot of f-ing idiots. I think a lot of is mean spirited just because it goes against what they believe. But the relief of comedy is it takes things that aren't funny and it allows us to laugh about them for an hour. We got a purple suit to buy and a gigantic <laughs> coffin. Why are you laughing? Evening, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Why Are You Laughing, a history of comedy podcast. And today, I am pleased to introduce to you Woody Allen, a man that his name comes with a lot of controversy now, but uh, we'll try and focus on some of the early stuff. I always get nervous with these episodes for a couple of reasons. A, Woody Allen's been talked about talked about a lot. The guy's been around for uh, 80 years, so yeah. it's tough to discuss anything that hasn't already been discussed. But generally, when we do these episodes, I don't have a reason to be nervous. The feedback is pretty good on them. Um, hopefully, uh, if you guys don't know a lot about Woody Allen, you learn something. And as I always say, if you do know enough about him, maybe it sends you on a trip down memory lane and you start looking into more stuff. Um, so we'll see. I'll be curious to get you guys' feedback. And uh, obviously, you know, Woody Allen's name has a certain panache to it these days you know he's lumped in lumped into a certain category but the guy did have uh an insane career so we'll talk about that and then of course we'll get into the controversy as well at the end um so uh we'll, we'll see what you guys think but first i want to let you know to go to blindmike.net if you wouldn't mind if you like this show if you missed us while we were gone and you need more uh because we did take a week off but we put up a bonus episode so if you guys want to check that out become a patreon or youtube member subscribe and you get early access to this content as well as bonus stuff so uh consider becoming a a member if not just support the show for free if you wouldn't mind everywhere you get podcasts including youtube please subscribe like comment all that stuff uh, helps boost the numbers and get more eyeballs on this program so you know tell a friend Put us in your Instagram story and spread the word. What do you say? And the easiest place to find all those links, blindmike.net, as if you didn't already know that. Um, Go buy also, a shirt, buy a hat. Yeah, buy a hat or a shirt or something if you want, if you so choose. We appreciate it. Um, also, since since our last episode, we lost the great Richard Lewis, which is very sad. Mm. Uh, definitely a guy who was influenced by our subject today, for sure. If you watch five minutes of any of his stand-up, you can probably tell that. Yeah. Um, but also, I just wanted to mention that because a few people reached out and said, you got to do a Richard Lewis episode. Well, you silly geese, we already did. So go back through the archives. Um, <laughs> I like how uh, they, they know that, so, oh, he died. There's definitely a Why You Laughing next week. <laughs> there's got to be, baby. Um, so, yeah, go through the archive. We, we've done like 120 of these or something like that. So. Uh, if you feel like you haven't seen all of them, give it a give it a second glance, uh, because yeah, we did do a uh, Richard Lewis episode that uh, some people seem to enjoy. So go check it out, will you? Let's do that. All right. Um, so Woody Allen. <laughs> it feels like I'm saying like a dirty word now. It's weird. Like it's almost like you can't talk about these guys. Uh, some of these guys respectfully. Like I plan on doing a Cosby episode too, and it's tough because. You know, 10, 15, tw- certainly 20 years ago, uh, these were guys that were on everyone's top five comedians of all time. And, you know, if a guy commits some misdeeds, <laughs> it doesn't make you a worse comedian. You know, that's what that's what's weird about these. It's almost like if you talk about his career, it's like you're supporting him in some way, which I don't think those two things correlate, you know, <laughs> separate the art from the artist. Because when you look back at what Allie, Woody Allen did, it's pretty incredible, and he's also not viewed, uh, it, and I think this is true of a lot of guys that started in the same era as Woody Allen, where there, there are certain guys you think of now as prodigies because they started young, Eddie Murphy, Freddie Prinze, uh, Bo Burnham, even, you know, like, I don't think Pete Davidson's done a lot with his career, but you're like, holy shit, he's on SNL at 21. That's pretty crazy. Yeah. Uh, Woody Allen started writing when he was like 15. Like started getting his jokes into newspaper columns and stuff like that, and then was a television writer. It was still while he was a teenager, so like he was a prodigy at a pretty early age, and he talked a lot about his family. Um, like in one inter- interview, I heard him say something to the effect of like, "I just wonder 
what my life would have been like, what my career would have been like, what my appetite for art would have been like if my family was more cultured and put more in, more of an emphasis on art and culture. Um, and that's the, and that's a natural thought for a lot of people to think of. But my thought is always, well, maybe you would never would have had a thirst for it, you know? Like if Woody Allen wasn't out playing stickball in the Brooklyn streets as a kid, maybe he wouldn't give a shit to learn more. Like if his parents shoved that down his throat, maybe he never would have thought to care about it, you know? Um, but yeah, his uh, his childhood certainly developed his nebishy attitude, which has been uh, the brand of Woody Allen's. But that was another takeaway I did from uh, the research I did in this episode where I'm not a huge fan of Woody Allen's work necessarily like it just not that it's bad it just never caught me really um so i kind of fall into thinking of him in the stereotypes that a lot of people categorize him in like when i went and back and looked at a lot of his stand-up i thought it would all be you know my 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 back hurts and (laughs) (laughs) i'm afraid of catching a cold like they've given him this like nebishy jew sort of stereotype when it's not exactly that there's there's a a hint of that in a lot of what he talks about but you know he talks about like his divorce and therapy and things like that that became very modern topics so while i'm not necessarily a woody allen fan i'm a massive fan of a lot of the people that he influenced like clearly louis ck is a huge uh, hugely influenced by woody allen larry david's probably the most obvious example ever um where it's like just a, a clear descendant of woody allen um, and obviously I'm massive fans of those guys. So, um, but he, he spawned a lot of influences that we'll talk about, but first let's, let's get into some clips here for goodness sake. This is uh, him talking about college. Yeah. So Woody Allen's one of those, um, stories that's, uh, ultimately detrimental when people find out about it. Cause it reminds me a lot of when people are like, you know, if you suck at basketball and you're like, Hey, Michael Jordan got cut from his varsity team, you know? Yeah. And it's like, yeah, well, you're not Michael Jordan. So, but that's uh, kind of the, the similar story that Woody Allen had as a as a youth. I was um, thrown out of NYU, mm-hmm. uh, and uh, I went to City College shortly afterward because my parents were crushed that I was thrown out of NYU because I failed my major. You know, I was a, a motion picture production major at NYU, which was a really easy course where you just have to see movies and such and mm-hmm. stuff. And um, and I failed it. I, I um, how do you fail that? You don't look at the movies when you show them. You mean you sat there with... Yeah, yeah. you face away from the screen. And um, so they threw me out, and then I went to City College, and I got into their film production um, Mm -hmm. course, and and, uh, I didn't like it, and they were not crazy about me. And um, so they threw me out. So when you look at it and say, you know, Woody Allen failed out of NYU and Stuttering John allegedly passed with flying (laughs) colors, maybe degrees don't matter so much, you know? Or they're fibbed about, possibly. <laughs> well, who knows? But I, I think that's the case with a lot of um, very high-functioning intellectual people like that, where it's just you get bored in school, you know? I mean, there's also there's people that are dumb, like me, that just can't pay attention in school. But someone like Woody Allen, like you just can't focus on school because you got so many things going on in your mind, and you want to do so many different things that maybe that school's curriculum just doesn't grab you for whatever reason um but it is funny to think he specifically failed out of film school and became <laughs> one of the most prolific directors of all he made you know 50 60 films or something like that so um pretty crazy it's crazy, it's crazy that he's like yeah i failed but would you do? he just didn't watch the screen <laughs> i mean like that yeah that i didn't guy, do any work <laughs> it has to be <laughs> why, it why do you think i failed yeah but uh next he uh talks about his writing a little bit okay is this uh tv writing Uh, I think the stand-up, possibly. Oh, okay. Let's hear that. When I started out, of course, as I've said many times, I was just a writer and wrote. Uh, Wanted to be a comedy writer, wanted to be a playwright. But that's what interested me. And I was hired by NBC. They had what they tried. They tried, it was a well-meaning thing, a writer development program where they gave a very substantial salary to a few handpicked writers, young writers, so that those writers could survive. And those writers was, had to write. And they tried to, their plan was, 
to let them develop as writers and to try and apprentice them on shows so that they, you know, now again, I was, you know, 18 years old at the time Crazy. and I was one of the writers that they wanted to hire and they hired me. Yeah, it really is nuts how young he was. Mm. Um, now, that is also different. Like a lot of 18-year-olds are out, you know, serving in wars and feeding their families at this time. So it's a little different than an 18-year-old now. But right. it is still crazy to think. Um, the other thing I think of when I look at guys like this uh, from Woody Allen's era is how much smaller, like Hollywood itself was so much smaller than it is now. Oh, my um, God. Yeah. Comedy, to an even more extreme degree, was smaller. Like anytime you look back at these people, you realize in New York it was pretty much, you know, Lenny Bruce, Woody Allen, <laughs> Joan Rivers, Carlin. And some people you never heard of, you know, <laughs> like right. it was not a big uh, group of people the way we can rattle off, you know, uh, 150 people with me uh, decent podcasts that make a living on comedy right now in uh, New York, you know. Um, so it's a totally different ball game that he was dealing with. And yeah, he's one of the guys when we talked about Mel Brooks and Carl Reiner past episodes, go check him out. Um, Woody Allen's name came up because he also he was one of these guys that wrote for Sid Caesar. So when I talk about Hollywood being small, um, Sid Caesar, I think Woody Allen wrote on Caesar's show, not your show of shows. Um, but both of those shows developed a lot of young, very talented writers like Mel Brooks, Carl Reiner, Woody Allen. Um, and I don't know if you remember, we mentioned the name Neil Simon, who was a writer for Sid Caesar, also his brother Danny. And the reason I mentioned that is because Mel Brooks said uh, basically that Danny Simon was an asshole. He was like, yeah, fuck him. <laughs> he was no, he was crazy. I think he called him. Uh, Woody Allen said Danny Simon was a huge influence on him and helped him a lot. So uh, different relationships we had, they had with those guys. But yep. and, um, <clears throat> we have him because he was uh, uh, had influenced heavily at first, at least by uh, Mort Saul. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I'll get to that in a second, but I just wanted to say that um, with uh, the Sid Caesar show, that's another thing about television being such a like a small circle, because that was a niche. Odd, it feels weird to say, but TV in the 1950s was kind of like podcasting three or four years ago. You know, <laughs> where you're like, holy shit, you can make money doing this, and a bunch of people are going to watch you. you it was kind of a very new thing, so it was almost easier to get into, which is why you had guys like Woody Allen at age 18 getting that sort of opportunity. Um, but he, Woody Allen wasn't totally comfortable writing for other people and sometimes didn't get things on air because, you know, Sid Caesar, let's say, didn't have the same voice as Woody Allen, and he would submit right. his jokes because of that NBC program to a lot of different outlets. Um, some worked, some didn't. And uh, Milton Berle told this story where I, I, Milton Berle is like a known thief. So it seems like kind of a bullshitter when you hear him talk. I believe part of this story, not the entire thing, but Milton Berle was basically like, uh, you know, Woody Allen submitted some jokes to me and I told him, hey, these don't fit for me, but you should do them yourself. Um, I don't know if Milton Berle is necessarily the guy that told Woody Allen that, but I do believe that type of feedback is what led uh, Woody Allen to thinking he could do that kind of stuff. Now, he wasn't necessarily sure he could until he saw another guy we've covered before, Mort Saul. And one of the things that they told me to do, there's, a, there's this comic at the bitter end, at, at the, the Blue Angel, sorry, uh, named Mort Saul. And I want you to go down, take a look at him, because we think he's kind of interesting, and see what you think. Because we're thinking of developing him for NBC, and maybe you could do some writing for him or something. And I went down there. I was, uh, again, I was just a kid. I was really 18 years old. And this guy comes out in a sweater with a rolled-up newspaper. And it just completely you know, changed the history of comedy. I mean, it was, it was you know, changed. If, if one could use the cliche, change the face of an art form, that's what it was. He, he was just amazing. He was such a skillful performer, so skillful that 
nobody thought he was performing exactly. They thought it was just a guy talking to him. People, I always heard comics say, I, why is everybody so excited about him? I, I do that all the time. I can just talk to people. Yeah, it's that in itself uh, is something that Woody Allen re really adopted. And those two guys, along with others, obviously, Carlin being a big one, Richard Pryor, but like guys that just spoke like themselves started to become the norm in comedy. And now if you don't do that, you're almost considered a hack where it was the reverse in the 1950s. Um, like if you listen to Woody Allen talk and we're here, we'll hear a little of his stand up in a second, but I, I think I probably said something about something similar about Mort Saul when we talked about him, their delivery, like there's something, you know, very familiar to the like Borscht belt cat scales era when you hear them when you hear their delivery but then what they're saying like the substance like mort Saul's just railing against nixon or something <laughs> <laughs> and woody woody allen's you know talking about his divorce or getting rejected by women and you're like oh wow this is new this is very different in the 1960s it had so it felt familiar to people in the sense that th their deliveries was uh, were similar to comedians they've seen in the past but it was something completely new and fresh. So they were able to kind of bridge the gap between those. Whereas I think Lenny Bruce was at the time, it's funny to say this now when you go back and listen to the lingo, like, hey, daddy-o. But like at the time it was much hipper <laughs> than these guys, you know? Yeah. So it was probably harder for like a mass audience to relate to someone like Lenny Bruce. Whereas Woody Allen, they could because the subject matter was so relatable to people. Uh, but we actually have a clip of his early stand-up. It's in black and white, believe it or not. And, and I got to say, I, I feel like I've said this before about other guys, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. But I think Woody Allen is the hardest to clip in terms of like, like what the bit I would have chosen as an example of his stand-up is the moose bit. But it's a, you know, three and a half, four minute bit. And you can't really cut any of it out <laughs> right. because he does talk so naturally like it's just a discussion that there there are punchlines littered within there but it's hard to pick up pick apart for like a you know a one minute clip or something so uh, i did the best i could he is a, he does have a bunch of he only did stand up for about 10 years or so uh but he does have a bunch of clips out there you steve allen jack parr uh carson like he did all the shows back then um so this is a little taste of that that I was booked on the show uh, around three or four weeks ago and it's not my first TV appearance but I was um, I never joined before this AFTRA which is an actors union and I had to join it to do this television program and when you join the union they make you join it's compulsory uh, a hospitalization plan and it's a very funny plan because it's like the Columbia Record Album Club, you know? <laughs> they send me every month a list of operations, you know, and <laughs> I got to pick out six for the year that I want, you know? <laughs> then they remove from me a bonus internal organ of my own choosing, and <laughs> I get a Bach record when the whole thing is over. So I'm happy. I'm not, I wanted to use my minutes up here tonight to uh, relieve myself uh, of a sense of repressed hostility against the law. I have never had, this is true, any brushes with the law of major consequence. I, uh, this doesn't count, this is insignificant. I was once sitting home in my house and some cars pulled up around the house and they shined in searchlights and I heard a voice over a loudspeaker say, we have your house surrounded. This is the New York Public Library. <laughs> <laughs> So, so you get you get a taste of his style there, and it's weird because like you would you would never think like oh clearly Woody Allen was an influence on like Chris Rock like their styles what they talk about don't seem related at all. But then when you hear Chris talk, Rock talk about Woody Allen, you're like oh this guy was a massive influence on him. And then the more you think about it, you're like oh well they both do clearly have this thing where they almost kind of like repeat themselves or Woody Allen stammers a little bit, but it's all purposeful and for the, the purpose of timing. Whereas Chris Rock has that where he kind of repeats himself over and over to get you to the punchline, like to build, you know, suspense basically. And Woody Allen has a lot of that in his delivery where it almost feels like, like you know, Shane Gillis is kind of like this, where you're watching him thinking like, oh, this is a guy just getting up there bullshitting basically but every word is very purposeful 
And Woody Allen was an early master of that for sure. And it's also, I think, what made him such a great film writer is the focus on language and every single word mattering, you know? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but we have him uh, talking about his intro into film. Yeah, so this is uh, some of his early film work and how he basically got carte blanche to do whatever he wanted, which is very rare. Complete autonomy in the film business is very rare, but Woody Allen got it pretty early on in his career. Yeah. You know, it didn't seem it didn't seem inevitable to me. I was not that interested in it professionally. I was interested in being a playwright. And uh, when I got to be 19 or so, and I was I was writing for television, and um, I, I wanted to be, just write for the theater. That's all that interested me. And I only got into films circuitously. I I um, wrote play before I wrote a film, and um, you know I I just. Um, I was hired to write a film, which was once a new pussycat, but I never yeah. even count that because that was just like being hired to write a television show. I mean, I had no interest in it and, you know, I did it and they what paid me and, right. you know, but, but, um, but I just wanted to write for the theater. That's all that interested me. And then, then I, I wrote something for the theater and I, and I wrote this, this film script and because I had had a negative experience on once a new pussycat, um, I decided that unless I could direct the film i wasn't even going to bother to make it i mean i didn't care enough about it even and and coincidentally they let me direct it because there was a new company at the time and they were hard up for directors but you uh, he been by the way he really hated his experience on that what new pussy kept i listened to 10 or 15 woody allen interviews and every single one of them <laughs> I think I think the exception is when he's being accused of pedophilia. I think it's the only one he didn't complain about what's new pussycat on. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's the only time he didn't bring that up. Um, but yeah, he really hated his experience on that. You know, was kind of uh, doing it for the money, basically. And what yeah. he learned through that is that that wasn't fulfilling to him. And so he said, well, I'm not going to write these films unless you do, do let me do it the way I want. And the thing I thought of immediately when I heard that was an old we probably played it in the louis ck episode um but an old louis ck clip when he's talking about the show louis on fx where he pitched it to fx and they basically said well yeah but what if it was more like this and he was like oh dude that was someone else then i'm not gonna do it and they're like okay well, hold on hold on hold on we want to be in the louis ck business here all right, fine. And Louis's like, yeah, I'm going to have, you know, lily white kids and the mom's going to be black. And they're like, well, what if you didn't do that? And he's like, all right, then I won't do the show. <laughs> they're like, no, 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 it's fine. Okay, all right, we'll stick with us here. <laughs> did you ever explain why he did that? Was it just to stick Just to be him? weird. He thought the lady was a good actor. She's the best actress for the job, and he did it and never explained it. <laughs> no one brings that up anymore. Um. So, so, so that's what I thought of when I heard Woody Allen say that, where it's like he realized – kind of early on well if they actually want me then i'll just tell them this is how it has to be done like he evidently wasn't afraid of losing out which again for a guy that's known as being so neurotic and anxious pretty ballsy i, I don't know that that's actually true of him <laughs> because i think it takes a lot of balls to be like oh well we're gonna do this my way or i just won't write movies anymore i'll do stand up or something that doesn't make necessarily make me as happy but i'll figure it out you know maybe the uh maybe the anxiety comes from early on in his career when he would write something and someone would kind of take it and make an adaptation how they saw it instead of how he saw it that's possible because he is he talks a lot about he, he's kind of one of these annoying guys who's <laughs> extremely successful to kids like, <laughs> like a, a he's a master at film and yet there's a bunch of quotes where he's like you know, just once I'd like to make a truly great film in my life. And I don't think I've done that yet. And it's like, all right, Woody, you're great. We love you. You're the best. <laughs> like if Tarantino said that. Manhattan but... was really good. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. Yeah. What's next? <laughs> uh, Ex-wife. Uh, yeah. So this is this is the style. I think like you saw a change in Woody Allen where he became much more serious. But this was him on talk shows back in the day where he was a more... Uh, kind of freewheeling fun guy when he would go on you know dick cavett and shows like that are, are you in any kind of legal 
hassle. Now, the last time you were here, you had a couple of lawsuits going, and I wondered if they've yes, resolved. I, my, uh, I don't know if I can say this. I'm, my my ex-wife is suing me because I made a um, an amusing remark about her. Um, <laughs> <laughs> she um, she lives on the Upper West Side of Manhattan, mm -hmm. and she was coming home late at night, and she was violated. That's how they put it in the New York paper. She was violated. And they asked me if I would comment on it. And I said, knowing my ex-wife, it probably was not a moving violation. <laughs> <laughs> so she's suing me, you know. Well, I, 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 I used to have legs back then, huh? Say again? I said, uh, uh, like suing someone for that had legs back then, eh? Yeah, I, I suppose. Um, so... Like there was there was a shift in Woody Allen. Now, to be fair to him, I think now when guys like do stand up for X number of years and then get into the movie business and kind of just drift away from stand up, it's looked down upon. Like it's not really respected by pure stand ups necessarily. But to be fair to guys from like Woody Allen's era, pretty much everyone that we've talked about did not want to be in comedy originally. Right. They all because it wasn't a thing. Like other than maybe Lenny Bruce and I, I can't even remember if that was the case with him. Um but like they the comedy wasn't necessarily a real career path. It was a way to get into film or Broadway or television. Um and it, it was kind of a means to an end. So I think the case with Woody is like once he became this massive figure in film and could do whatever he wanted uh he basically said that stand-up was just taking away from that like it made no sense for him to do stand-up because film is the art form that he just preferred so he put out three or four albums in the 60s all very well received and then that was kind of it um like he had this co short career in stand-up and then just a massive film career after that it's i'm trying to think of a parallel because kind of like uh larry david almost but i don't think uh, well larry david was nowhere near as successful as stand -up. like Correct. i would say larry david wasn't even a successful stand-up really no I, he has we wouldn't know larry david if it if he didn't get into tv writing correct um i mean i would say more i guess like eddie murphy or steve martin where you had this massive burst when you're young and then that's kind of it. Like Steve, Steve Allen will still do appearances at award shows and stuff like that. Eddie Murphy, probably a little more rare. And we'll get into the one instance. Woody Allen returned to stand up after 30 years, which we will play in a bit. But he's one guy that just didn't really didn't really seem to have a love for it. He did. He would put stand ups in his movies. Mm -hmm. um, probably the most uh, surprising one would be Dice. Yeah. Where that that is one thing when you look at these guys, like Woody Allen seems like he would be a snobbier figure and right. look down at someone who had the career of Andrew Dice Clay, but evidently under he got what Dice was doing and he respected it, and that's something you gotta kind of applaud a guy like Woody Allen for because it's easy to judge Dice on the surface, but I think if you see the character that mm -hmm. Dice is playing, you realize okay, this guy's brilliant. He's doing something very unique. Right. Um, next, we have uh, Hannah and her sisters. Uh, yeah, so this is just him talking about that film. Obviously, again, like I said at the beginning, we're barely going to scratch the surface on Woody Allen's career. He made a bunch of movies that were nominated for Oscars. Uh, Annie Hall, Manhattan, um, Hannah and Her Sisters is another one that's very well-received and critically acclaimed, and we'll get into a few more that happened um, later on. But like I said, the guy was basically on a pace until... Uh, there was a blip in his career. He was basically on a pace of writing a, a movie every single year. Um, so it's hard to talk about all of them. But uh, here's a little taste of, as uh, I thought this was interesting, about Hannah and her sisters. The, the ending of, of Hannah seems optimistic. I mean, whenever I've seen it, there's been a kind of palpable sense of relief amongst the audience when Holly says, I'm pregnant at the end. Because... Uh, I think it's probably the first Woody Allen film they've ever seen which doesn't have a sting in its tail, where they don't leave thinking, God, you know, the last five minutes just turned me completely around. 
It seems optimistic. I mean, is it? It's uh, only optimistic in the sections that I failed because I wanted to make a film that was not optimistic. I wanted to make a, f a film about a man's irrational, sudden passion for his sister and for his uh, sister-in-law, you know, and um, f f a man who's told that he's going to die. And then suddenly when it turns out that he's not, doesn't want to go back to work or anything and just walks the streets questioning life and finally doesn't come to any big conclusion. You know, it reads all these books and all that and is going to blow his brains out, you know, and, and, and yeah. figures what the hell I, you know, I won't. Why, why should I? That's not going to solve anything. I mean, I wanted it to be a melancholy film for the most part, but for some reason, uh, incompetence in the directing or the writing or something, the emphasis shifted so that it was perceived by audiences as more up and optimistic than I had intended. Mm, and I, consequently was very popular. <laughs> he's, he's almost like mad that it had a box right. office success, you know? Like yeah. I, I, I do kind of respect that where he's like, hey, if you got any enjoyment out of this, it was a failure of mine. <laughs> I, I fucked up as a filmmaker. <laughs> but but it does, I, thought, I thought that spoke to the tone of a lot of his movies. And um, it's all a Chris Rock quote about Woody Allen stuck out to me where Chris Rock was basically like, I respect Woody Allen's filmmaking because he was a, one of the few guys that understood you should – the, the importance of drama writing. He's like, basically what Woody Allen would do, even in his movies that were, would, were considered pure comedies, he would write a drama and then pepper it with jokes. Right. Like the, the core of Woody Allen's movies are generally sad or coming from a place of um, some kind of anxiety or depression that he's putting out onto the screen. Uh, and yet he's able, he's able to make a lot the, the majority of them uh, to an extent funny, uh, but, but he knows like he dwells on there's another uh, great interview he did um i i forget if we already played or we will play uh, one of the clips from that but it was called like the origins podcast or something uh it was only from a few years ago and they talk about the meaning of life and i think woody allen and that's the subject of um some of his films or even like if you you know dig deeper probably uh, the majority of his films have something to do with the meaning of life and he is a very deep thinker when it comes to that stuff and has an interesting perspective that i think was able to make him um a great filmmaker similar to larry david now larry david did pretty much the exact opposite of woody in the sense that like the rule on seinfeld and ultimately curb was um no hugging no learning where it's like this is purely going to be funny we're not teaching you a lesson and woody allen whether he meant to or not would kind of teach lessons through his films i don't think either is bad i think there's a value to both of them but it's just like i i'm a i'm a simpleton so larry david relates i'm able to consume his stuff a lot easier than right. uh, some of woody allen's deeper thinking stuff you know yeah uh i think this next clip is actually from that podcast uh it's him talking about uh, characters yes so i i i found this to be uh interesting as well because that's the the thing I, so woody allen stars in a lot of his films but even the ones he doesn't like we i i don't know if we talked about this uh with will ferrell but i read and heard a lot about it the one woody allen movie that will ferrell was in um same with larry david the woody allen movie that he was in a lot of these guys say like oh well woody saw himself in me and so he cast me in this film that seems to be um the kind of stereotype that woody allen movies have been labeled with woody doesn't really agree with that characterization Everyone seems to think all your movies are autobiographical. Mm -hmm. Why Why they do is an interesting question. They don't assume other people's movies are autobiographical. And, no. and, and I wondered if it's because the character you play in movies is a natural outgrowth of your stand-up. And so people always see the same, to some extent, the same character from the time you were before you're making movies to the time after, and therefore assumes... It must be you. I, I, you know, I once heard Marlon Brando say in an interview that people confuse him with the characters he plays, yeah. and that he was not like that. He was not Stanley Kowalski, and mm -hmm. and I, I'm not like that. Yeah, no, I mean, I, uh, I think and I'm... and but. If you see Charlie Chaplin, for example, mm -hmm. you know this guy puts on a little mustache and his cane yeah, and his yeah. hat. I 
play in a movie and I, this is what I wear, <laughs> yeah. you know? Yeah. So they th understandably think that the guy in Annie Hall or the guy in Manhattan or the guy in any is me, give or take a few emotions or a few exaggerations. And sometimes it is true that the character will be saying something that I babble about in yeah. life or, mm -hmm. you know, but the characters in my movies are greatly exaggerated because otherwise the movies would really be dull. Yeah, yeah. If I was <laughs> the character in the movies, <laughs> you would go to sleep in the first <laughs> reel so sure. and but, or leave the theater. And, and I would say that's not entirely fair for him to compare himself to like, oh, hey, Vito Corleone. No, <laughs> no, I'm Marlon Brando. It's not exactly the same thing because Woody Allen, it's not just that he, you know, talks the same and acts the same in his movies as he does in real life it's more that um the character like the interviewer there said um displays a lot of the characteristics of what he did in his stand-up but also like he's a hollywood upper middle class writer from manhattan who's interested in young women <laughs> it's like right. you did leave some breadcrumbs woody it's not entirely like people didn't just completely reach to get to that conclusion that a lot of these films are autobiographical and to some extent now what i will say and this interview was obviously done uh, well after a lot of the accusations that we'll get to which is probably why he's kind of spinning it that way what i will say is i don't think it's fair that oh he was you know lusting after an 18 year old girl in manhattan so he must be a pedophile like to me, that's not a that's not a one to one equivalency, you know. Right. So that's where I think Woody's like, hey, that uh, not everything I do, right, guys, you know. <laughs> but I do think it's a fair comparison to say like a lot of his writing is autobiographical because I think if you listen to, you know, people that make films in general, they will say that to some extent, everything is auto like even you know, um, Quentin Tarantino, who obviously didn't grow up in slave times or Nazi Germany. <laughs> There's some autobiographical aspects in the sense that uh, he uses his experiences and his knowledge and injects them into his films, you know? Yep. And um, here we have him talking about uh, comedy versus drama and why he chooses. Yeah, so this is, this is an opinion I don't really agree with. Him. Well, I should say a lot of Woody Allen's opinions I don't agree with. <laughs> This is the one. <laughs> There's plenty of things this man thinks that I I shun. Yeah, but but uh, his his take on comedy here I don't necessarily agree with. But we'll talk about it after we hear. When you made Interiors in 1978, you said that comedy was really like kiddies' food, and that you wanted to eat at the grown-ups' table for once. Mm -hmm. Did you really believe that? Uh I do. You know, I have very specific uh, ideas about that, and I don't mean to proselytize or or uh, convince anybody of the way I, I think. that These are purely personal ideas. Um, but I, I do see a difference between comedy and so-called serious drama, and I personally hold one in higher esteem for myself. I prefer one to view i prefer one to do if i if i could and um and i do think I, I i do make a value judgment and find a deeper value in one than the other but it's a massive downgrading of your own work in a way because i would have thought your whole work stands as an example to the contrary i i don't think so i i now again i don't mean to downgrade comedy i think it's a wonderful thing and you know but but i put the other on a higher plane myself. Um, and I think to the degree that some of my films have been good, it's been to the degree that I could make them more serious. And to the degree that, say, Charlie Chaplin was more outstanding to me by far than, say, Laurel and Hardy or Buster Keaton even or mm. Harry Langdon, it was because he chose to get more serious. Sometimes he got so serious that it didn't work. But when, but what gives his film more richness is that there's seriousness to it. Um, and for me, the great 
you know, the great artists, of course, I, I like the, 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 the dramas of Shakespeare and I don't like the comedies of Shakespeare very much. Uh, and I just don't think that's a fair barometer to go by. You know what I mean? Like, mm. I, I, I think he, he got to a point where he was um, uh, a, a little snobby when you talk about some of this stuff. Now, I will say, much like Seinfeld, what I, the credit I always had to give to Seinfeld is when he, uh, you know, kind of pontificates on his philosophies and things like that, that does turn me off. He is pretty good about saying, like, this is just my opinion. Right. Right, he's not. I'm, I, I'm not right. I believe right. I'm right, but but I'm not necessarily right. And Woody Allen's good about that too. Whereas in, in this interview, he's kind of saying like, "This is just for my personal taste. Like I'm drawn to darker stuff." Right. He's not saying this is concrete. This is better. It's, it's not. Yeah, like right. it's not Hannah Gadsby saying that <laughs> Kevin Hart's not a comedian because he's not screaming about rape. <laughs> you know. <laughs> <laughs> It's a little, it's a little more open-minded. Where he's saying, like, for for my personal tastes, I do believe that drama um, is just a better art form. But I, I think the, the the problem, the stigma that comedy has, is even some of its greatest contributors, like Woody Allen, kind of hate comedy, <laughs> kind of look down at comedy. Um, I think because there is so, so much self-loathing, I think all entertainers probably deal with a great deal of self-loathing, but comedians seem to wear it m much more on their sleeves. And so I think that self-loathing turns into hatred for their art form, which develops into them saying, oh, well, drama is harder. But if you listen to a lot of actor, a lot of great actors, they will tell you the comedy is harder. Like that's why they say a great comedic actor is able to adapt to dramas better than the other way around you know it's why robin williams could be in a drama but you know i don't know um daniel day lewis isn't in uh, dumb and dumber you know right <laughs> but uh which i which i would watch by the way correct uh you know he says he prefers drama and he took it off the the big screen and took the big drama to his personal life here we're gonna talk about oh well i guess all right so we're getting into this part so <laughs> <laughs> Boy, what a career he had, gang. And I would say, even in, here's the interesting thing. Uh, some of the interview we're about to play you is from 1992, I believe, a 60 Minutes piece in 1992. Um, he was nominated for an Oscar. I think Husbands and Wives was nominated in either 91 or 92. Um, so that's what's interesting about the whole Woody Allen story uh, <laughs> is that this didn't really phase society like no. it kind of came up again i think a little before the me too era but right around that like when cosby started getting in trouble and things like that people started bringing up this woody allen story um and for multiple reasons which we'll get into but the one thing that did kick it off to be like oh woody allen's kind of a creep is uh he ended up marrying his stepdaughter or at least that's how it's been labeled mm -hmm. now the actual story is that Sunni Previn was adopted by Mia Farrow. Mia Farrow adopted a bunch of kids. Um, Sunni was one of them. Woody Allen had nothing to do with, and I, actually I should have pulled the clip because it was so bizarre, but in one interview from uh, 1987, this is uh, the, the good days. So uh, Mia Farrow and Woody Allen were married and things were going great. <laughs> <laughs> but even then, Woody Allen was talking about um, having a different house than the rest of the family. He had a house on like the other side of town or the other side of the street or something where, and he would stop by and visit the family. And then when he was annoyed by them, he'd go back home. <laughs> and I was like, that's a, it sounds like a dream lifestyle, but that is very bizarre. Pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> so he wanted nothing to do with these kids. And by all accounts, he had no relationship with Sun Yi. So it is his, adopted stepdaughter i guess is how you would label that but they had no real relationship and then um one day when mia farrow was in woody allen's apartment he found nudes of sun yi um now she, again she was an adult i don't know how far back this relationship extends but by at least woody allen and sun yi's account everything was above board so apparently um, when Woody Allen and Mia Farrow got into a messy divorce, some allegations came out that you guys probably know about, I'd have to imagine. But if you don't, if you just think Woody Allen, oh, the, the 
the, the funny movie maker, then uh, <laughs> we're going to break your heart here because there's some allegations, but we'll uh, explain once we hear the clips. The allegations are that you took Dylan into a attic or crawl space, mm -hmm. that uh, you touched her in her private part. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is there any truth to that at all? Look, be be logical about this. I'm I'm 57. Isn't it illogical that I'm going to at the height of a a very bitter acrimonious custody fight drive up to Connecticut where nobody likes me in the house. I'm I'm with a house full of enemies. I mean Mia was so enraged at me and and she had gotten all the kids to to be angry at me that I'm going to drive up there and suddenly on visitation pick this moment in my life to become a child molester. It's just it's just incredible. I could, if I wanted to be a child molester, I had many opportunities in the past. I could have quietly <laughs> made a, uh, a custody settlement with Mia in some way and done it in the future. I mean, you know, it's so insane. You got to say, it's a very odd sentence. To say if I wanted to be a child molester, I had many opportunities. <laughs> but I gotta say, yep. I don't think it's something a guilty man says. Correct. You know? <laughs> <laughs> like, it's a it's a decent point. <laughs> well, I good. know what the I know what the comments are gonna be. I know my reputation. <laughs> but <laughs> but I think the man makes a good point. But it, it, like in all seriousness, in these cases, like with Cosby a litany of allegations come out afterwards. There's not a single other, again, if you want to use Sun Yi as the example, but there's no allegations of like underage stuff, at least not to my knowledge. The accusation with Dylan Farrow seems to be wholly on its own. Um, now there are also like Mia Farrow has said things basically like uh, Ronan Farrow, who's Woody's only biological child, supposedly, uh, Mia says that's actually not the case, that she was still continuing her relationship with Frank Sinatra. A lot of people believe that just based on the visual evidence. If you just look at uh, Ronan Farrow and Frank Sinatra versus Woody Allen, well, it doesn't quite line. One seems more striking than the other. <laughs> um, so the, it, it, the divorce got pretty nasty. Um, Mia Farrow has... Uh, she's a bit of a loose cannon by, by some accounts. And so that leads to Woody Allen's theory here as to what exactly happened. Cause the one important thing to point out is I don't think anyone believes that Dylan Farrow is lying because she was seven years old at the time. So no one thinks that Dylan Farrow just on her own made up these accusations. Um, so Woody has a theory as to how that all happened. Either. She has been coached methodically to to um, tell the story because by Mia, by Mia, yeah. Because uh, because first of all, several weeks before it happened, Mia called me on the phone and said, um, in the course of an argumentative phone call, she said, "I have something very nasty planned for you." And I said, "What are you going to do? Shoot me?" When did this happen? This happened several weeks or a month before the allegations. This was last summer. Yes, this was a month before this happened. Um, and on many, many occasions, many occasions, over the phone and in person, um, Mia had said to me, you took my daughter and I'm going to take yours. What did she mean by that? She meant by it that I had formed a relationship with her 21-year-old daughter and she was going to get my daughter, who still I only have one daughter. Um, that's what she meant. She was going to seek Take her, her away her revenge that way yes because of your affair with sun Yi. <laughs> yes yes absolutely you took my daughter i'm going to take your daughter alan content so his beliefs seem pretty clear um i would recommend going and watching two different documentaries if you're interested in this subject uh hbo put out a multiple part documentary a couple years ago that's clearly leaned toward Mia Farrow. <laughs> like if you're looking for that yeah. perspective, the HBO documentary is clearly that. Um, and that was uh, it, produced by Ronan, wasn't it? You might be right. I don't remember, but yeah, well, that sounded like right. One of them was. Yeah. 
Um, so, I mean, that's clearly leaning in one direction, and I would say the opposite. There's actually a very good uh, YouTube documentary about this subject that breaks it down. And the guy doing it is a nobody that seems not to have a dog in the fight. He's like, I have no interest in this. It's just I'm looking at the facts. And he goes through um, some of the, the trial cases that were that were done and the um, investigation that was done into Woody Allen. And to me, I lean more toward that one, having seen both um but maybe that's my own uh, uh inclination you know maybe i'm biased in some way so i did also want to hear from mia farrow just in the interest of fairness we have a clip of uh, her side of the story here too he said that you coached dylan did you ever coach dylan no. into making up the accusations of sexual abuse of course not no i mean dylan was speaking spontaneously and i grabbed a camera and it is clear that I've seen that tape, <laughs> that the child is speaking. There were times when I was even interrupting her. She's speaking from her own heart. And uh, I don't believe her. It's a very upsetting It's the phone ringing. It's not her fault. <laughs> to anybody who, who, who sees it, that there's no coaching there. Um, even Mr. Allen knows that. First of all, he knows Dylan, and you can't coach Dylan into anything. And second of all, it's obvious from the, from the quality of what she's saying, from the, from the urgency with, with which she's saying it. I don't buy it. I realize now my own sexism, choosing a fo uh, clip with the phone ringing loudly in the background, <laughs> drowning out the woman speaking. That's my fault. I apologize, folks. If anything, I think the phone helps her because she's like, oh, no, of course. Not. I don't know. I don't buy the way she said it. I don't buy it. Yeah, I, it's, it's, well, it's tough. Here's the odd thing about these cases is we will all give an opinion. Correct. <laughs> and not a single one of us have any idea. Nope. None, none of us were there. The only two people that we'll, we'll ever know are Woody Allen and Dylan Farrow. And again, Dylan Farrow was so young that maybe even she won't. Um, so that, that's where it gets tough. But um, yeah, I don't know. Make your own opinions. Leave them in the comments. Uh, you guys let me know. But what I find odd is the world after that. Because whatever you think, in my opinion... It seems like America thought Woody Allen was innocent for mm -hmm. a hell of a long time, even to where he got to make his comeback uh, at the 2002 Oscars after 9-11. That's our next clip, right? Correct. So um, post 9-11, they thought, hey, you know, like we want to make a special tribute tribute to New York. Who's more New York than Woody Allen? Because one of the things Woody Allen was great at is building this like romance with New York City. Um, like tr truly, you felt like it, it made it a desirable place to visit, even the negative things about New York. Um, like it, may, it made it feel cool, which is weird. Like that's how you know a real skill. Like you don't look or listen to Woody Allen and think that's a cool guy. But right. somehow he had like a cool persona to him. I think because he was, you know, um, very on it, very true to who he was in his films, and you know society kind of respected that. Um, and he was able to to create a real romance romance around New York. And after you know a thirty plus year break from stand up, this reminded me of uh, did we, didn't we play in some context maybe on the Blind Mike project? But when we talked about Eddie Murphy, yep, um, doing the Kennedy Center Kennedy Center honors, yep, and you're like, oh wow, he's still got that muscle. Yep. That's what this Woody Allen thing was like, where you're like, fuck, this guy hasn't done this in 30 years, but he's still got it to an extent. <laughs> got a crazy ovation. I had to cut some of it out. Yeah, cut a lot of it. It's like a minute and a half in. Thank you very much. That makes up for the strip search. <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you why I'm here exactly. Uh, about four weeks ago, I was sitting home in my apartment in New York, and the phone rang, and a voice on the other end said, this is the Motion Picture Academy of Arts and Sciences. And I panicked immediately <laughs> because I thought that they wanted their Oscars back. Because <laughs> I've won a few Oscars over the years, and I thought they you know, that they were calling to get them back. And I panicked because the, the pawn shop has been out of business for ages, you know, and I have no way of retrieving anything. And 
they said, no, this was not it. That, and I, I couldn't figure it out because my movie, The Curse of the Jade Scorpion, was not nominated for anything this year. Nothing, no category. And then it suddenly hit me, maybe they're calling to apologize, you know? <laughs> 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 I think even in there, you can hear the Larry David. Like if Larry David had to do that, that a very similar set, I think you're right. getting. Like you can hear right. the Larry influence for sure. And in very Woody Allen fashion, I heard him uh, talk about that afterwards. And it's cool. It, it's such a cool. Mo if you take out the controversy, just the idea of a beloved stand-up stepping away getting into film for 30 years leaving stand-up having this big moment after 9 11 representing new york and when he was asked about it he goes oh it was a real pain in the neck because i had to keep it such a secret like he, he was annoyed <laughs> that he had to do it basically <laughs> <laughs> but the reason uh you know the reason i lined these up in that order is mainly because i wanted to show what's weird to me is society the, the way society reacts to all of this. Um, mm -hmm. So that Oscars appearance is 10 years after the 60 Minutes interview that we just heard. So what that tells me, again, I was very young at the time, but that, what that tells me is that society was like, no big deal. Who cares? He's not in <laughs> and, jail. He must not have done it. Ah, who, big whoop. Um, then to the point where Woody Allen's highest grossing film was Midnight in Paris in 2011. Um, I, his most recent Oscar nomination was 2014 and that's when things started to get murky for the Woodman, because I believe that's the same year that Dylan Farrow now an adult, um, put out a statement where basically I, I remember Diane Keaton really getting a beating from this Diane Keaton, if you don't know, um, dated Woody Allen and was the, um, you know, romantic lead in a lot of his films. Um, particularly his biggest ones like Manhattan and Annie Hall. Um, so they, like, they were obviously linked throughout their careers. And Diane Keaton has talked about what a genius Woody Allen is. And I remember part of Dylan Farrow's statement was basically like, Diane Keaton, you knew me when I was a child and you've just ignored me. And that statement of her basically saying she was an ignored victim of pedophilia started to hit home with a lot of people. Mm hmm because I remember a lot of people picking that up and being like, Jesus, particularly my generation, I was in college at the time. I never heard that in my entire life in, you know, 23 years of life or whatever it was at the time. I never heard about those allegations with Woody Allen. So I think younger people were like, what, what's this now? Pedophilia? What the fuck? Right. <laughs> he diddled his daughter. What do you, no one mentioned this. Right. So that's that's where I think a lot of people that had never heard the case before start getting involved. And then it becomes if you say, no, 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 there's more to it. It's like, oh, so you think you can just get away with the And the, that then it becomes very murky. And again, because Dylan Farrow is the one saying this happened, a lot of people jump to, oh, so you're saying Dylan's lying. I don't think again, I don't think anyone believes that. I think the idea that Mia Farrow coached her is definitely plausible. But again, I have no fucking idea what I'm talking about. Dylan Farrow's experience is her experience. I'll never know any more than what she says. Um, so it is definitely a gray area. I think there's something to Woody Allen saying, why after 57 years of life would this be the one instance where I do that when I'm going through a tumultuous divorce? Doesn't that seem like odd timing? Um, but it has kind of caused... Uh, Woody to drift away, um, you know, is, is, and this was true. Um, you know how Scorsese a few years ago talked about the Avengers movies Yep. and basically said like, what a shame it is that art has gone this way. Yep. Woody Allen, I think said something similar, like 20 years prior <laughs> where he was, he was basically like the type of, the type of films that Woody Allen makes. You know, I looked up some of the box office gross of even some of his, like uh, Blue Jasmine, for example, made um, 33 million in America and I think like 99 worldwide or something like that. So it made more money internationally than it did here in America. So studios, like major studios are looking at that and saying like, it's very easy for us to distance ourselves from Woody Allen now. Right. You know, I do believe that if similar things came up with 
Christopher Nolan or someone like that, it would be harder for studios to be like, well, fuck him then. Well, it kind of did. So with, long, uh, you old coot. The guy that um, James uh, Gunn. Yeah. It, and then the whole. Sure, I mean, the 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 issues there weren't as serious. That was just his tweets, right? Yeah, but it was like weird, creepy, like pedophilia tweets, if I recall. Right. But the, and the yeah. whole cast kind of stood behind him, which was different. Right. Yeah. So it, I, I do think there's an element of Woody Allen's movies just weren't what studios were buying anyways. So yeah. it's easier for them to be like, and he's 88 years old. So for right. them to be like, so long, Wood, you know, enjoy <laughs> retirement. Yeah, that's that's pretty easy. And it shows you how shitty the business is where they're not taking a moral stand They're They'll honor the guy at the Oscars or what that um, Oscars clip reminded me of was. Um, um, I keep wanting to say Ronan Farrow, Roman Polanski, mm -hmm. like. Roman Polanski was basically in hiding for child rape and was honored at the Oscars. <laughs> and they stood up, whoa, yes, what a career. <laughs> but once it became unacceptable to do that type of shit, everyone, you know, you get the videos of like, shame, shame on you, America. It's like, no, it was you guys. It was Hollywood. It wasn't <laughs> us. <laughs> it, was, it was you that was allowing all of this. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. You guys... You guys let me know. Maybe this will be a controversial one in the comments. I don't know. We'll see. But uh, Woody Allen lived, uh, uh, you know, like, what, what's actually, I was about to say he lived a controversial life. What's odd is he didn't. Like, right. if it wasn't for that, this would be kind of a boring episode. <laughs> <laughs> so, hey, thanks, Woody, for spicing it up at the end, you know? <laughs> it's kind of like, it's kind of like at the three-quarter mark, actually, where he spiced it up. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I mean, clearly clearly a comedy legend and what's most insane to me is that he only had a 10-year run in comedy and was able to be so influential and i would say that's the only other guy that's really true of is steve martin because i think even eddie murphy like eddie murphy was obviously massively influential mm -hmm. but i think some of what he was doing like prior still would have influenced a lot of guys that would consider themselves influenced by eddie murphy yeah. you know yep. and then i think that's probably true of the next generation with chris rock is a lot of the, like there are other eddie murphy's whereas i think woody allen and steve martin and you know red fox i would say is another guy because i'm trying to be uh, racially i realized i eliminated all the black guys so I'll throw <laughs> red i'll throw red in there <laughs> these are guys that like before them there was no one like that really you know yeah um, so are we at our last clip here? Yep. Favorite segment. Well, this usually lightens the mood a little. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's why I, I like to end with Norm Macdonald. You know, we go out on a bang. I don't know that that's accomplished with this story, but this is uh Jim Downey on the fly in the wall podcast with David Spade and Dana Carvey. And they are talking about the most controversial weekend update joke. Uh, one that never made the air and that Jim Downey warned Norm about. He had this joke where it was, uh, well, Woody Allen is dating again. And it was the image of the naked Vietnamese girl running down the road after the oh, napalm attack. That old photo. That, old that, photo, old, that yeah. famous old photo. And so my only reaction to that was like, North, come on. He goes, no, no, what? come on. It's funny. Come on, it's, it's funny. funny. I go, Norm, Norm, <laughs> no, it's not. No. And to this day, I don't know. And and I go, Norm, please. We No, if you do that joke in front of an audience, you, A, you're going to take down the rest of the, the show. The next three shows <laughs> will be hurt. Rockefeller Center. You can't do that. Ah. You can't. I mean, it'll take the, the temperature in the, in the studio down 30 degrees. There'll be like ice on people's, you know, beards and stuff. You can't. Can I say, by the way, yeah. no, no. just real quick, I feel like saying that to someone like Norm, yeah. like just makes him want to do it that much more. For sure. <laughs> He's like, you mean it'll ruin everything? <laughs> just that smirk. Yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Come on, it's funny. So they, he and Frank, and Frank was backing him on it. Frank Sebastiano, Sebastiano one of the right. best okay. update writer ever. And he, um, oh, he loves uh, it. And so, and so, and Frank was not, I couldn't, I would look over at Frank, and Frank was not, he wasn't like winking or anything. And so I go, okay. So we tried it in dress, 
and it had precisely the effect. I thought it would, although who knows about future shows. But anyway, <laughs> it was like this, like <gasps> this collective giant gasp. And then uh, so after that, Norm was willing to give it up. And then we didn't do it on air, obviously. But like years later. So that was like I'm going to say that was maybe 1996. So mm -hmm. at least 10 years later. Steve Higgins, you know, who's current producer of the show, comes up to me and says, do you ever remember, and we're looking for a sound effect of an audience being like horrified, offended. <laughs> and I go, I got it, I got it. So I said, like, I directed them to that update. And I said, just, I'm pretty sure if you take that thing, the other thing is it will be uncorrupted by any laughter. So you'll get a nice clean take of of gasping and horror. And so they, they they I didn't remember which show was from, so they had to like plow through a lot of dress rehearsals, I guess. Mm -hmm. But a few hours later, Higgins said, Oh my God, we got it. And it is everything you said. So I, they use it. And I'm to this day, I'm pretty sure they have it like on a cart. So whenever they need the sound effect of something, not just not getting a response, but getting kind of active hate, you know, yeah. it was that moment. Yeah. If that's true, if that's still used as like the soundtrack of uh, disgust, that's so I think that might be the greatest element to Norm's legacy. For sure. <laughs> he was able to invoke that level of a reaction. Like, like it's used in all movies, like that kids playing sound effect that you always hear. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> That's very funny. Yes. So uh, shout out to Norm. Really had nothing to do with Woody Allen, but that, the joke was about Woody and Sunye. So I felt like it fit, you know? Sometimes we stretch. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, gang. Like I, like I said, as far as Woody's career goes, I, I'm aware we barely scratched the surface. Um, but I'm not. I wasn't necessarily a huge Woody Allen fan, so I'm not, I can't get it as in depth. Like we're not going to have a, a deep dive into, um, you know, Hannah and her sisters or something like that. So, uh, if you're a true diehard Woody Allen fan, this probably wasn't the most, um, uh, salacious piece for you, but to, to you layman's, I hope, I hope it was enjoyable. I hope you guys liked it. I'm sure you'll let me know in the comments, please do. Cause, uh, all that helps the algorithm. Give us a like, and uh, subscribe and furthermore if you want to become a member go to blindmike.net you can become a patreon or a youtube member subscribe uh for you know the low price of five dollars a month a cup of coffee and uh, you get early access and bonus content so check that out asap blindmike.net you can also support the craigster and uh, all of the activities that he's got he's got going on at very good show dot org big fan of woody allen big influence i don't think um, so says says from the 90s on that guy really hit his stride so <laughs> go to a very good show dot org and support all the craig files out there <laughs> please and thanks but not not that wasn't true guys <laughs> all right well <laughs> debate in the comments and we'll talk to you guys next time on why you left zip it up and zip it out <laughs>